everyone, and welcome to Rise Up LA, Voices from the Women's Movement. Now, if you're watching this on the air date of August 18th, 2020, it is the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which granted most women the right to vote. Now, in the museum's uh, newest exhibition currently taking place online called Rise Up LA, you'll learn about how this did not grant all women the right to vote as well as the various women's movements of the last century, uh, with a special focus on those that took place in Los Angeles. Now, in celebration of this very special exhibition and anniversary, our performing arts program at the museum has embarked on an oral stories project, where we asked to hear from women in Los Angeles over the age of 65. Over 30 women took part in our project, and they were interviewed by one of our performing artists, Jenny Gillette, where they discussed issues such as feminism, uh, womanhood, the importance of exercising your right to vote, as well as many other interesting and sometimes hilarious stories. Now, oral stories collections have the ability to give a more personal and intimate uh, perspective on history or our current times. And the ultimate goal of our oral stories project at the museum is to create what we call an ethnodrama, where transcripts from the interviews are woven into a verbatim script that is performed before a live audience. Now today, you're going to get a glimpse into what that will look like as we hear from three of the women who were interviewed for our project, uh, Dorsey Dujon, Janice Lapellis, and Barbara Sanchez. Uh, they're going to share some of the transcripts from their interviews in conversation with Jenny Gillette. Uh, we'll also get a chance to hear from Sarah Crawford, Senior Manager of Exhibition Development and Design, and hear about the story they are trying to tell with the Rise Up LA exhibition. So I hope you enjoy, and thank you so much for taking part in this chance to amplify women's voices. Yeah, I think I've been a feminist since I'm about 12, 13, yeah. Anything that kicked that off for you at 12 or 13? Not being able to have a bat mitzvah. Oh, okay. it, was, <laughs> it was all about not being able to, I was the best Hebrew school student they had, and yet it, because of the time it was, there was no bat mitzvah at the time. Mm -hmm. So that's what kicked it off. I would have intense arguments with the rabbi about this. Mm. And he, he would never budge, never. I was never allowed to go up on the bima. I was never allowed to be in the central synagogue. I always had to be up in the balconies. It was, it was a, that was a rough path. I think my experience with Judaism taught, turned me into a feminist. When I was 59, mm -hmm. um, my mother had passed away and I wanted a Harley. Right, a Harley Morrison. So I actually went and took classes. I bought a big Harley. I learned to ride it. And it was a such a fulfilling thing because people acknowledged you. You know, as a woman on a bike like that, they people would come up to you and put their, you know, thumbs up and you know, and women would be like, How did you do that? I said, actually it was easier than I thought, you know. So things like that are empowering. The stuff that I did, that I initially was afraid to do, and did it anyway, is what empowers you. And it gives you the encouragement to move on to the next thing. I went over to the branch manager's desk and I said, excuse me, um, I'm getting paid less than these young men and I'm training them. He said, well, yes, they're in the management trainee program and you're a bank teller. I said, oh, I didn't know there was a management trainee program. How, how does one, how would I get into the management trainee program? Oh, it's not open to women. And I got kind of feisty and I said, then maybe you better find somebody with exterior plumbing to train them because I'm obviously not competent enough to train somebody who's eligible for that kind of position. And he said, young lady, that will get you right out the front door of this bank. And I said, funny, that's where I came in. Well, you know, I think because I grew up under segregation and just being a black woman, girl, it's hard to 
sometimes it's hard to tease out what's gender inequality, what's racial inequality. I will say that I grew up at a time that people had very fixed ideas about what girls should do and what boys should do. And including, you know, have it telling girls like myself that they shouldn't, uh, they should kind of conceal their smartness from boys. We're open. We listen. We learn to take care of each other. And we rely on our sisterhood to take care of us because there's something uniquely binding as women that we will always be able to take care of each other and rely on each other no matter what. I think that is something I'm very, very proud of. I am a retired educator and I do believe very, very strongly that girls from a very young age should be given the tools that are required to develop the, the resilience and the brilliance that we know women can achieve. It was never a doubt in my mind that I could be anything I wanted to be. My parents gave me that, and I really do appreciate that they did that for me. When I was a teenager, I was poking around in our garage, and I found a stack of books that my father intended to give away, and one of them was Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique. <laughs> and I brought that inside, and I was reading it, and I thought, yeah, women shouldn't all have to be housewives, you know? We're individuals. Why can't we do different things with our lives, too? I found women that I worked with who were really were bosses. And a couple of them really told me what I needed to do in order to be really focused and to learn everything I could. If you're on a job, learn everybody else's job because you never know when you may have to fill in, um, or, you know, or if you want to grow and learn and do things, that's what you have to do. And, and you have to be better than everybody else. Yeah. That much I did learn at home. <laughs> well, how are we going to rule the world if we don't, in the beginning at least, get the vote? Thank you everybody for being here. My name is Jenny Gillette. I had the privilege of doing a project for our Rise Up LA exhibition at the Natural History Museum. I got to interview 30 amazing women about their experiences with the women's movement and also just about some personal stories and personal journeys. And it was a really wonderful and moving experience for me. And I am pleased to be here with three of these women today. So you have already heard a little bit from them in our intro clip. Uh, you got to hear from Barbara Sanchez sharing her thoughts and feelings about sisterhood. Uh, you also got to hear from Dorsey Dujon talking about bosses in the workplace. And you heard from Janice Lapellas about her feminist awakening as a young woman. So all of these stories that you shared were really inspiring for me, but we also spent some time talking about challenges you faced as a woman as well. Uh, Dorsey, would you share your story about challenges? I'd be happy to. You know, I started working um, when I was about 19 in the 60s. And um, having had no experience, I was just out looking for work, not really knowing what was going to happen or what I would be able to find. And um, I did have a few interviews where I was told, oh, God, you know, you're really great. Um, we think you would get along really well with everybody in the department. And we think, you know, you, would, you could learn this really quickly. The only thing is, uh, the boss wants a blonde. Well, I don't know what I could do about becoming a blonde. And I know that today you can't really have that conversation with someone. They, there are parameters. But another job that I did get, um, I was working at a brokerage. And the boss came to me one day and said, uh, Dorsey, you know, we've got a young man that we're going to have join the team and we'd like you to train him. So I was like, oh, sure. You know, I really thought that was great. I'd be able to train someone. So that meant I had to have been doing a really good job. 
So I felt good about that. And I trained him. And um, then the boss asked me to come in and see him again. And I did. And he said, oh, you know, Dorsa, you did such a great job with him. I mean, he's he really caught on really well. He's going to be great. And he said, um, by the way, you know, he just got engaged. And um, he's going to be getting married and, and raising a family. And we're going to have to let you go. And I'm like, what? I, I could hardly believe it. Because at the time, I was a single mother of two. But I guess being a single mother of two wasn't quite as valuable as being an engaged guy, not even married yet, nor with any children. There you have it. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that story. Uh, Janice? Can we throw it to you next? Well, I probably faced my first challenge when I was in the seventh grade and informed my science teacher that I wanted to be a scientist when I grew up. And he laughed and said, oh, Janice, girls can't be scientists. And I flounced out of the classroom thinking, we'll see about that. <laughs> Years later, I was accepted into a doctoral program in a biochemistry department. But it was interesting. At the first seminar I attended as a grad student, the professor in charge announced, quite proudly in fact, I want you to know that this is the first class in which we've accepted more than one woman. There were five of us out of about 30 or 40 students. Mm -hmm. And the five of us looked around at each other as if, you're congratulating yourself for this? Because there are five of us instead of just one? I later found out that the chairman of the department didn't believe that women should be there at all and refused to speak to any of us. In fact, if I was walking down the hall with a couple of the male grad students and happened to pass by him, he would say hello to them by name and completely ignore me. It became kind of a joke because whenever I saw him, I'd say, hello, Dr. A. And of course, he wouldn't respond. And my friends would shake their heads or say under their breaths, wow, that's incredibly rude. But in all the years I was there, the chairman never changed his mind or opinion. Unfortunately, I became quite ill while I was in grad school and even had to take off a quarter. But when I requested an extra quarter to fulfill some of the requirements, my request was denied. I don't know the exact reason for this denial, but given all the other sexism and misogyny in the department, I wouldn't be surprised at all if it was because I was a woman. Thank you, Janice. Uh, let's hear from Barbara. Well, uh, for me, when I was growing up, my mom and her sisters, my aunts, would get together and they would talk about the different issues that were at the time pressing, including family, you know, politics, things in the community, and they were strong women. They were women who were intelligent and very vocal. Um, so it was rather surprising when my mom one time was talking to me and said that she would never vote for a woman. I was so surprised. I said, Mom, why not? And she says, well, I don't know. I just don't think I would vote for a woman. I said, well, is it because there isn't a candidate that you haven't found or you haven't seen a woman with the qualities that you would vote for? And she said, well, I just really do not believe that I would vote for a woman. I jokingly responded, mom, that's why we have library cards. But given the time that she was brought up during the depression, the war, uh, my aunts ranged in age, and my mom, they were born 1923 to 1939, my mom in 29. Uh, I kind of thought, wow, this is really amazing coming from a woman who bought her house at 19 for her, as a single woman, for her mom and her brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. But I do understand that the ideal dream at the time in the 40s and 50s was to be a homemaker, mm -hmm. just concentrate mm -hmm. on family. Mm -hmm. But it made me think, because I do believe my mom would probably go for a woman given today's atmosphere and if she would have found one that she thought was capable of leading the country. But it made me think that perhaps there are many women who have that type of thinking. Mm -hmm. 
And we have to be diligent. We have to kind of make sure that we don't lose our perception about what is important and to continue to preserve some of the uh, privileges, not really privileges, rights, rights that we have. And I do believe that we have to make sure that we are diligent in making sure that we empower women, whatever they may want to be, even if it's President of the United States, <laughs> that they can continue to that pathway because of our support and our diligence. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all for those stories. And thank you for the reminder to be diligent. Um, I feel like if there's anything that I have learned from this series of interviews, it's that we have indeed come a long way, uh, but we still have a really long way to go. And some of these challenges that we're facing and some of these obstacles that we're facing seem to just be sort of circling around <laughs> and circling back over the years. So I appreciate the reminder to stay diligent no matter what's going on. Um, something else that I really enjoyed discussing with all of you is this concept of feminism. And as I learned in these interviews, the word feminist or feminism can carry a lot of different meanings for people. Um, and those meanings kind of come on a full spectrum of, of bad to good. So I would love to hear how all of you react to the word feminist and perhaps a little more about how you identify on this spectrum of feminist identity. Uh, and this time, let's start with Janice. Well, I've thought of myself as a feminist ever since I was a teenager. But I've had various men tell me that I couldn't be a feminist because I obviously don't hate men. Apparently, these men believed that if you call yourself a feminist, you must dislike men, or you believe that women should have some sort of advantage over men. And I've always replied, that's not true at all. I've always liked men. I love working with men most of the time. It has always irritated me a little that we live in a patriarch society rather than a matriarchy, so that when I got married, I was expected to take my husband's last name. But really, what's most important to me as a feminist is that women have the same legal rights as men. For example, when I got married in the 1970s, it was very difficult for women to get credit cards. And even if you were married, you could only get a card jointly with your husband. I mean, that was ridiculous, ridiculous. And even after a law was passed that outlawed discrimination against credit applicants based on sex, it was still difficult for married women to get credit cards in their own names for at least a few more years afterwards. I finally did get one in my own name, but not until the late 70s or early 80s. In any event, feminism to me means that women should have the same rights under the law as men. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's hear from Dorsey. Well, I, I agree that we definitely should have the same laws uh, that, uh, that apply to men and the um, having equal rights uh, that we still don't have, and this is 2020, it is absurd. Um, when I was growing up, um, quite similar to the conversation that Barbara was having about her mother, my mom was actually 43 when I was born, and I was born in 1945. So I was raised with a woman who was born in the Victorian era, and she didn't talk about anything. I know she wanted to come to this country to become a nurse, and at the time when she did come, she wasn't able to do that because there were only two schools that accepted black women um, to train as nurses. And one was in Boston, which is where she was, and the other was in Philadelphia. Boston's, uh, what their, their quota was three. They had met their quota, so they told her she would have to go to Philadelphia. Well, to her, Philadelphia was way out west. So I say all that to say that the, the woman that raised me didn't exactly give me uh, that lesson of there were many women who were doing a lot of things and that they were successful and um, that these were women that I could look up to. The only women that I really saw were movie actresses and, that, that was, and people who were on television. I didn't have that, the opportunity to learn all about all of the magnificent women who had done extraordinary things, um, and even in entertainment. But what 
has made me feel good about today is that young girls today do have all of these amazing women, you know, um, astronauts and physicists and uh, engineers and, you know, um, extraordinary uh, careers, um, the women that are here. You know, so um, I, I feel that there is something wonderful about what's happening in that they come together, they're marching in March, they have the big, huge march, and women come out, and it's, it's an extraordinary thing to, to see us come together for, for, for what? For equal rights, to be able to do whatever we want to do, because we all have these extraordinary capabilities. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that story as well. Um, and I, for Barbara, I will say we did get to talk about this concept of feminism uh, and women's involvement in the, in the movement, uh, but sort of in terms of being here in Los Angeles. Uh, so Bar Barbara's a lifelong Angelino, and so we did talk about uh, the women's movement in Los Angeles, but also sort of about what's happening right now uh, with coronavirus and this pandemic and how women are coming to the forefront of that. Uh, so Barbara, I'd love to hear about that from you. Well, as, uh, as an Angelino, I'm very proud of the city of Los Angeles, which is one of the most diverse cities in the country. Uh, believe me, it has its problems, but and it will always have its issues. But we have, uh, because of that, diversity, a tolerance, a tolerance that enables us to reach out to one another. Uh, because of its size, Los Angeles is comprised of little neighborhoods, little communities that each of us have all the same issues that the city has as a whole. And we, whether it is activism, major activism, or the small uh, things that we do within our communities to resolve issues, we come together and we help each other. We try to be neighborly. And in that forefront, it is women that actually do that type of socialization, reaching out to one another and helping another. And we became a much more diverse sisterhood that reached out during crisis. And today, again, we have in my neighborhood, I'm in the Northeast section of Los Angeles, the coronavirus has shown us in the community that we need to do what we have to do to help each other. But now, instead of reaching over across back fences or backyards, we're actually posting online. And online, we actually have an app that's called Nextdoor that actually tells us what is available to each other. If you have chickens in your backyard, we're swapping that out for lemons. There's beehives, we're exchanging honey. We're helping everybody try to get vegetables or to get to the store or to the pharmacy offering babysitting services for women who had to leave the home but couldn't leave their children alone. We even have a six foot sewing circle in someone's backyard with women donating remnants or fabric so that they can get together and make masks. It's a community that is strong. It's a community that is extremely diverse, not only in race, ethnicity, but economically. We have all types of households. And I believe this is what Part of the feminist movement incorporates the, the sustaining sisterhood, the neighborhood, the community. We're all in this together. We try to help each other resolve the situation. We try to help one another get to where we need to be. In a crisis, women will always be in the forefront to get the issue resolved. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, well, one last thing I wanted to talk about. Uh, in our interviews, we spent some time talking about women's resilience uh, and from your perspectives, what makes you proud to be a woman. So I would love to hear a little bit about that. Um, this time, uh, let's start with Dorsey again. Well, I love being a woman. I, 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 I love being a mom, that uh, nurturing side. Um, and, and I do all of the fun, girly things, but I also, you know, as a kid, was a little tomboy. And I think um, all, all of the experiences that I've gained along the way have um, kind of helped to, to create this person that you see today, which um, because of 
the movement and of, of how we feel about community and activism. I think that um, I'm a lifelong learner. I mean, I will never stop learning and particularly from a great many of the women that I'm around and women here today. The stories and the life experiences and I think what we come by naturally in our ability to to give and I think we, we give of ourselves and um, and women really give tirelessly without looking for some thanks. And I, and I believe that in, in times like this, um, we absolutely need to have that nurturing factor and that, that we have it and we can use it and we can come to um, solutions and work on problems that we don't look at them like, oh my God, this is such a problem, I can't do anything about it. We really can, if you sit all of us down in a room together, we could map out what could happen in a matter of hours or less about what we should do about certain things because we all have these gifts that we bring to the table that, that create this strength that we have. And that strength is, you know, I mean, through our experiences, yes, the knocks on the head, the picking yourself up and, you know, dusting yourself off and getting back in there and doing it again, I think mean, we really have that far better than, than the ability to, um, to get it together and, and go back because um, it's been a long road of that. And every day since 2016, it's been, uh, well, what's happening today and how are we going to get through this? And the, the fact that we do come together and we are able to, to work together and nurture and take care of our families, take care of our jobs, and, and do it seamlessly, hats off to women. We're great. Nice. Um, I will send it to Barbara next. Well, I concur with Dorsey. I do know that we do have a, naturing, uh, a nurturing nature. We think very well for ourselves, but we think always of others. So we do have the balance that brings to the table a much more overreaching thought process to get solutions for problems. Uh, I do believe that the outlook that we have is surpasses that of men in times at times, primarily because they're such linear in their thinking and compartmentalized. We have always had that aspect of nurturing that is more inclusive when we try and resolve an issue. We're not just an immediate situation. We tend to see what are the consequences if we're going to take on an issue, if we're going to really fight for something to be resolved. It's a battle that we take on. It's a battle that we um, totally embrace. But it's also a battle that we utilize our skills for bridging differences and making alliances. There are many more, there's many ways of taking a hill. It's not just one way. And so when we go to battle, we don't have to annihilate everyone on our way to take that hill. We can actually take our time to know who and what we want to accomplish. Where's the resistance? Work with them make sure that we have the ability to understand their position, negotiate, make some concessions. And as we go to the top, we make friends and we all get there together. Trying to resolve an issue that encompasses the best for the common good for all of us. And I think that's an important reminder for people to see that when we bring to the table, we do have so many different experiences. We come with so much talent and a lot of knowledge. And as you say, we have the resilience and we probably can take on a lot more than most people give us credit for. And we do it every day. It's just that we don't talk about it as much. So I do believe that women have that mix that makes life better, makes it better for the community, families, and now we have to start thinking about us. <laughs> nice. Excellent. Let's hear from Janice. 
Well, in addition to the qualities mentioned by Dorsey and Barbara, I'm proud to be a woman because I think in many ways, women are stronger than men. You know, the old joke that if men had to give birth, no one would have any children, or at least <laughs> not more than one child. But really, women are mentally and emotionally much stronger than we've ever been gre given credit for in the past. Not that men can't be mentally and emotionally strong also, but women are strong precisely because we've had so many obstacles to overcome. And not just sexism, but other conditions unique to the female gender. Personally, I suffered from a variety of health problems throughout my life that I probably wouldn't have had if I'd been born a man. But I had to develop the emotional fortitude to get up every day and take care of my children, to work, to do what I had to do, regardless of how I felt physically. And the fact that I've been able to power through all the roadblocks that I've encountered in my life has made me realize that I, along with so many other women I know who've had their own obstacles to overcome, not only have the qualities of warmth and nurturance, but also a kind of strength or endurance that most men never have to develop. Wow, thank you all for those perspectives, for those stories. Uh, this has truly been an honor and a really, really inspiring experience. Um, I just wanna give us a moment uh, does anybody want to say anything in reaction to these other stories that you've heard or add anything else? I'll say sometimes when I ask that question at the end of our interviews, sometimes that happens to be the most interesting segment of the whole thing. Well, I would say that in terms of what Barbara said and her mother not wanting to vote for a president, mm -hmm. I think that's fairly common in that generation. And um, I've thought for a long time that we should, uh, if you, I don't seem to recall in a history class learning about the great women leaders of the world. You, you always learn about the men and you never learn about the women. And there have been one, there have been really ferocious queens in the past and, and all sorts of strength displayed by women. And, um, and yet we never learn about that in school. And I think if more women understood that there have been really strong leaders in the past, um, and even, even women scientists and, and all these other professions, sure, they were few and far between in the past, but they existed. <coughs> I think we should learn more about them in school. A lot of things that are sometimes glossed over. Uh, Dorsey, I saw that you were about to react to that. Well, yeah, it's, it's really true. I mean, the, the first woman millionaire that made her own money was a black woman. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that when I was a kid. <laughs> you know, I, I yeah. have no idea. The, mm -hmm. the man who invented ref refrigerated cars on trains was a black man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Black history, too, should be incorporated as part Absolutely. of the whole deal. Absolutely. That, that, I think, is something that's so true. And, and when you talk about being whitewashed, women have been washed out. Mm -hmm. but, but there is something now. The New York Times does have a section. It's in the obituaries, but it, it recognizes all of these amazing women that, that no one ever knew about and knew about the things that they did. So, I mean, talk about resilience. I mean, to the fact that they had done some of the things that they did so long ago. And who knows? I mean, do we rewrite history? I mean, do we do that? Do we go back and, and, uh, and make the corrections? Well, I like that we're having an opportunity to, to retell it a little bit, hopefully a little bit better. Um, Barbara, did you have any reactions or anything you wanted to share? Well, I thought it was very interesting about Dorsey's experience in the workplace. Mm -hmm. I was once told by a boss who was very, very formidable. He said that the best time to hire women, the best reason to hire women is because they gave so much. Mm -hmm. They were able to work like two men. So he would often think that having a woman in the workplace is getting two for one. He believed that we overcompensated. <clears throat> we tried very, very hard to make sure that 
as he said, take that hill with everyone supporting us. And he found that, he was one of the few, found that it was a very, very good idea to promote and have women. Mm -hmm. But it was very interesting that although he happened to be the boss, those supervisors under him did not share his opinion. Mm -hmm. As a result, uh, we never really, if I remember correctly, were ever able to get past that type of limitation. We would not get promoted, but we would be transferred over to something else that had to be taken care of, a crisis of a different type. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it's, it's interesting to me that you can try and, and, and move forward, but you'd have this middle management sometimes that would kind of keep it down. And I always thought that I can understand, I can see what Dorsey is saying. Um, the idea that women work so hard, that are so resilient, they're so strong, they bring to the table so much, they can get people to work behind them and move forward. But they do not get compensated for it correctly. Oh. And that glass ceiling is still there. It's still there in the workplace now, it's, in, it's still in the university. Mm -hmm. And it's it's probably the one thing that we're going to have to really address in the future because that is that is just not right. Mm -hmm. We need to have equity pay mm -hmm. for, for women and we need to recognize that we do work very hard because we know we have to do that much more to get ahead. But it also means that we have to um, get more women elected to office. Mm -hmm. Because policy changes need to be made, and we need women in the position to make some of those changes. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I feel like that's a great way to promote visiting our exhibition website. Uh, so the Natural History Museum has a, um, an online exhibition for Rise Up LA. Um, Rise Up LA is celebrating the 100-year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. Uh, however, as we're talking about, uh, even celebrating the 19th Amendment is kind of a layered thing uh, because it did not grant all women the right to vote. Uh, that didn't happen until the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which I'm not a historian, but one last thing I wanna say uh, is that it's been a pleasure speaking with the three of you. It's also been an amazing pleasure speaking with all 30 women that I had the privilege of interviewing for this project. Um, in addition to the Rise Up LA exhibition website, we will have a full archive of all of these interviews. So I hope that everyone will visit that, listen to some more of these amazing stories. And uh, just a reminder again to stay diligent and that this battle to have the right to vote is something that didn't stop with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And in some ways is still going on today. So please do exercise your right to vote and stick around for our next little segment. But thanks again, everybody. Bye for now. Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, again, I am Jenny Gillette, and I have the pleasure of being here with Sarah Crawford. Uh, Sarah is also a storyteller, uh, but kind of in a different way. Um, she works with me here at the Natural History Museum. Sarah, can you start off by introducing yourself, maybe your position title, and tell us a little bit more about uh, what you did for the Rise Up LA exhibition? I'm Sarah Crawford. I'm the Senior Manager of Exhibition Design and Development at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. And on this exhibition, I worked with a team of curators, designers, um, community engagement, uh, council members to um, come up with the storyline for the exhibition and to really bring it to life for visitors. Great. Um, so I love that you have this connection to storytelling. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you work as a storyteller uh, within the context of exhibition design? Yeah, uh, you know, exhibitions are a weird place to tell a story because um, you're working with a 3D space. Um, so you can't really predict how visitors are gonna move through that story. Um, so they could walk in, visit one label and then leave. That might be the only thing they, they read in the entire exhibition. Um, so you kind of have to account for spontaneity and um, you also just have to plan, you know, so that your, your big idea, your main messages um, exist 
and are reinforced in kind of every piece of content. Um, you know, but that's one of the things that makes it really fun is that uh, this is kind of, you know, exhibition design is an interactive experience with visitors because they they bring their own past they bring their own ideas and you know plans sometimes you know they'll end up using an interactive completely differently than how you intended and um i think that's what makes storytelling in an exhibition so fun um so it it's it's really different than you know writing a, a story or writing a book um, you never know what people are going to do nice well i guess given that element of unpredictability uh, that you don't know how visitors are going to experience things or in what order. Uh, what do you think are the most important takeaways from this particular exhibit? Yeah, so for us, um, you know, the exhibition starts with the passage of the 19th Amendment, and we really wanted to make it clear to visitors that with that amendment, not every woman got the right to vote. Um, some women got the right earlier. Uh, California was one of the states that, um, you know, where women uh, won the right to vote in earlier in 1911, actually. Um, but then most women actually didn't gain that right until much later. Um, and so we, we really try to reinforce in the exhibition all of the work um, that, you know, has gone into um, women's rights over the last century, you know, and that there's all of these um, fights uh, you know, and marches and movements that have happened that, um, you know, aren't really separate from women's rights. They, they tie in very closely, um, you know, so women fighting for education or community or, or the labor movement, um, civil rights, all of those things um, were also about women's rights. Uh, these, these movements can't be completely separated. They're intertwined. And, I, you know, the other thing that we really wanted to drive home is that, um, you know, we wanted to tell the stories of, you know, these extraordinary important women in Los Angeles County that have made a big difference, but we also really wanted to demonstrate that, you know, it takes the actions of many people often over a really long period of time to make change. And sometimes, um, you know, actions that are just everyday actions, like, you know, going to work and asking for a raise, um, or, you know, going to your neighborhood meeting and, you know, demanding environmental justice, you know, um, things that, we all, you know, everyday people can do, uh, or voting, that's a great one. Um, it makes a difference. And, and we want to inspire people to, you know, go out and take action and to look at the women around them in their own lives and, and honor them for the work that they've done and are continuing to do. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. I, I will say, um, from what I've seen so far of the exhibition, I have learned a lot. Um, and there have been a lot of takeaways, namely what you mentioned that, we're sort of taught in schools that the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote. That was it. The fight was over. But I feel like now we are talking a little bit more about um, intersectionality and how being a woman and also your class or your race or other a number of things might have prevented women from getting to the polls or getting to vote. And I think that it's so important that that story is now being told on a little bit a little bit of a larger scale. I so yeah. um, I should ask too, because I always ask this at the end of my interviews, but do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I'm, I'm really wondering, you know, you've, you've done all these interviews, you've spoken now to, I think you said 30 women. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of your main takeaways uh, from this process? Yeah, so I think, and I mentioned this a little bit in, um, in the previous segment, but something that I want to really remember uh, is that we do have to stay diligent. I think that I so appreciated the wisdom of many, many decades uh, that I received from these women and their stories. Um, I think selfishly that was something that made me want to do this project was that I got to speak to incredible women with decades worth of experience and I think that some of the, the rights that we have today uh, seem to be things that are cyclical. I think that some of the battles that these women fought generations ago, we are in some ways still fighting. Or there are things that, that we have today that could at any point uh, be changed or taken away because other people have differing opinions. And so I think one big takeaway for me is 
never take anything for granted. Be diligent about what are your rights and keep fighting. And I think that's something to remember because we have come a long way, but in some ways, like I said, things are cyclical. So yes, so the reminder to stay diligent is something I'm gonna hold close. Yeah, and we certainly see that, uh, you know, and you know, that's a theme that we really touch on in the exhibition as well. We actually have timelines in each section that show how, you know, women in 19, you know, 10 were fighting for education and women today are still fighting for education. So seeing that those issues build upon each other and sometimes we have successes and then have to kind of go back and repeat them. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And so I'm also wondering, you know, you're a storyteller as well. So what, um, what drew you to this story? You know, what did you see, you know, in this narrative that you thought would really make a, a good program and a good, um, performing arts event? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I will say I, I so appreciated the opportunity to conduct these interviews. Um, and I'm a member of the performing arts team here at the Natural History Museum. So I am a storyteller, mostly a performance-based storyteller. I'm also a teaching artist. So I, I feel like as an educator, I tell stories as well. But I think me, at least to the way that this story is being told uh, is that I, I, I love, I love interview-based theater. And I think at some point in the future, when we are able to gather together again, I really, my hope and my vision for this project as a whole is that the performing arts team can have a full interview-based performance of this live and invite more of these women from these interviews to tell their stories in a live setting. Um, and something that I think is really wonderful about that is that uh, as an actor or as an educator, we, we tell stories, but we kind of have, well, we have a script most of the time. And I think as an actor, uh, I hope I can tell a story authentically, but when I'm memorizing lines, if you think about it, that's not really the way that we speak. And <laughs> it is a crafted story that we're telling when we put on a play or, or even when we, when we have a lesson plan. There's a, there's a, sometimes a loose plan, but there is a, a plan. And what I love about interview-based theater is that it's somebody's real life. It's a real story. It's being told in the way that we really speak. Um, I did it just now. I say, um, I repeat <laughs> myself. I hesitate. I don't do that usually when I'm performing on stage. Uh, but in interview-based theater, that happens. And I love how raw and real that is. So that's something that really drew me to this format um, and something that I hope we can continue to share as time goes on. Well, you know, it's clear in listening to your interviews how much you enjoyed this process. And, you know, I wanted to actually repeat back uh, one of the questions that you asked to, to the women you spoke with. Um, and that's, uh, what makes you proud to be a woman? Yes. Um, thank you for asking me that. I realized when I've done interview-based projects in the past, sometimes I interview myself because it seems only fair. Uh, but this was a question that I didn't really have a chance to ask myself <laughs> until very recently. Um, I feel proud to be a woman because I think, um, I think we still face challenges as women today, but I think that Maybe, maybe for one of the first times historically, it feels like we as women have the potential to break through a lot of barriers that um, maybe hadn't been as possible in the past. Uh, I also think it's a time that we are learning more about women that did break through barriers. Uh, <laughs> there are so many stories that have not been told, and I think that that's something that's happening a little bit more now. And whenever I hear a story about a victory um, that hadn't been shared maybe until now, I feel really, really proud to be a part of that <laughs> just by sharing this uh, identity as a woman. Um, but something that I've been thinking about, um, I'm, I'm a new-ish new mom. I have a 14-month-old son. And something I've been talking about with other um, moms that I know uh, I feel that our generation, we have been raised, or I feel that I've been, I've been lucky to be raised uh, as a, a woman, a strong woman. Um, 
our generation as women, I think, is really starting to break through barriers and banding together in a way that is awesome and makes me proud. But um, I think a goal of mine that I feel proud of is that I want to be a part of a generation of women who raises a new generation of sons who know how to be supportive and know how to be allies and I know a lot of wonderful men of my generation out there that are already doing this, but I think that we as women have the power to do that even more. And I hope that I can do that for my son. That is a goal. That is something that I'd be, that I'd be very proud of. And I think that um, I've enjoyed speaking to a collective of women out there that are doing the same. Well, I just want to say that, you know, listening to these interviews made me proud to be a woman. And I don't know if that was uh, the original intent for this project, but I certainly hope that, you know, the women that watch this video, the people that watch this video and, and uh, get to take part in this performance, you know, feel the same way. Um, and that, that sense of pride, you know, so thank you for all the work that you've done. And, you know, and to all the women that, you know, spent the time talking to you, I think that um, this was a really wonderful project to be part of. So thank you very much, Jenny. Thank you for saying that. I think uh, it's been such a moving and wonderful experience being able to hear all of these stories. I hope that you all will listen to them as well if you haven't already. Um, and yes, as you said, Sarah, thank you to all the women that have shared. I really appreciate that we have a little bit of space to share those stories here because they need to be out there. And I'm really glad that they are.